Okay, I want to now talk about the force necessary to make something move in a circle. And I'd like you to do an exercise for me. Take a soccer ball, baseball, tennis ball, basketball, um, and give it a kick on the ground <clears throat> so that it uh, moves. And you should notice that when your foot lets go of the ball, it will move in a straight line, right? So that's hopefully not surprising. That comes from Newton's first law that says if there's no force on, net force on an object, it's just gonna keep moving in a straight line forever. Now, granted, there's actually a horizontal friction force that'll eventually slow it down. Um, if there was no friction, if you were like on a perfectly smooth frozen lake with literally no friction, it would move forever in that straight line, okay? Um, now what I'd like you to do is repeat the same kick as before that would have made it go in a straight line, but this time I want you to immediately with your hand or a, or a um, baseball bat or a, some other stick or something, I want you to gently keep tapping the moving ball to make it go in a circle, okay? So, for example, maybe you want to make it go move uh, 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 clockwise. So, do that and then think about the way the direction and the strength of how you, of the forces that you're applying with your taps. Okay? So, do that for a few minutes now, please. Okay, and then I'll, we'll continue. Okay, so if you tried that, what you um, should have noticed is that if you're moving in a circle, you're always having to approximately keep tapping it towards the center. So here's the center of the circle that in my diagram, okay? And um, so I, you might notice at that point you had to tap it that way and then you have to tap it in with this purple vector representation okay and as it moves the direction you have to keep tapping it changes why because the direction towards the center is changing isn't it okay so you keep tapping it tapping 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 and then that'll keep it moving approximately in a circle all right now all of that was to say that It'll turn out, if you want something to move in a circle, you need a force, and let's say, to keep it simple, let's say moving in a circle at a constant speed, okay? If you want that to happen, you have to keep applying a force towards the center, okay? Now, the strength of the force doesn't need to change. So the magnitude, to use a fancy word, it will be constant. However, the direction will keep changing. It'll keep changing such that it's always pointing towards the center, okay? Now, for whatever reason, physicists can't just say center force. Maybe that's too simple. So we have to use a, make up a fancy term so that we impress people. Um, what we actually call the, this force is a centripetal force, okay? Where centripetal means center seeking, which is what, I, what I've been saying um, that um, the, this force is doing. So it's a center-seeking force, okay? Now, so, now, I said that I talked about moving in a circle at a constant speed, okay? Let me ask you a question. Is there an acceleration for something moving in a circle, like a satellite or like the moon? and a constant speed. Is there an acceleration? Okay, now you might think that because the speed is constant that the, there is no acceleration, but that would be wrong, okay? Remember uh, what the definition of acceleration is, and let me write the vector form. Change in the vector divided by the change in time. 
Now, how, how many different ways are there to change a vector? There are what types of change? Well, you can change the length of the arrow, the, the magnitude of the vector. That's one way to change a vector. But can't you also change the direction? Okay, you might, if you didn't think that circular motion at a constant speed had an acceleration, that's because you might be focused on the fact that um, acceleration doesn't just mean the change in speed, it could also mean a change in direction. Okay, um, let me give you a, uh, a quick side tangent. Let me give you a, a quick little question to clear this up if that was confusing. Suppose I was bouncing a ball. And suppose the ball, um, suppose it, it moves down at about three meters per second. And then suppose after the bounce, it is coming up at three meters per second speed. Okay, so this, I'm somehow, I don't know if it takes talent to do that. Maybe as I'm a really good dribbler, so I'm bouncing, bouncing, bouncing. And it keeps three, three meters per second speed down, three meters per second up. Um, the, does there exist an acceleration for this process? Okay. Yes, there do, the, yes, it does have an acceleration, even though the speed is the same. Let me show you why. Okay. Um, if let's define, let's pick a, a direction to de, to to we'll define it to be positive and another direction to be negative. So let's say we'll define up to be positive y and then down to be negative y. Okay. So the initial uh, velocity, remember acceleration is it has to do with the change in velocity, not speed. The initial velocity is minus 3 meters per second. The final velocity is plus 3 meters per second. Okay, so acceleration is delta v over delta t. And let's say that a bounce, let's say I'm doing it for a one second interval. Okay, so v final minus v initial over 1. So 3 minus negative 3 over 1 gives 6 meters per second squared. Check it out. Okay, why? Because we changed the direction. That's why we can have, we had an acceleration for this situation, even though the speed was the same. Okay, so we're going to find out that in something moving in a circle at a constant speed, likewise, there's going to be an acceleration. Okay, now you're not responsible for deriving the acceleration of something moving in a circle. Let me give you the result and then I'll show you how you could derive it if you want to. And um, you could ask me if you want further details. Um, but if something is moving in a circle at a constant speed, the acceleration must be equal to the square of the velocity divided by the radius of the circle that it's traveling in. Okay, now here's the way you would work that out. So pick any uh, small time interval and at let's say at the beginning of the time you have some v1 and then a very small time later you've got a slightly different velocity. Okay, so we'll call this v1 and v2, okay? And between those two time intervals, there is some change in the angle. Let's call this delta theta, right? And we said that it's moving in a circle, so the length of those red arrows is the same. So v1 equals v2, uh, talking about the magnitude, not the direction. Okay, and um, we know that the triangles, the, if you made a triangle with V1 and V2, so let me make, uh, if I was to copy those vectors, okay, and draw an angle between them, so here's V1 and here's V2, Okay, that is going to be what's called a similar triangle. Let me call this triangle A, and then let me call the one inside the single triangle B. It'll turn out that those are similar. Okay, 
um, similar means that they have the same shape but not necessarily the same size and um, what that and by the way the this little distance here the small side of this triangle that's the length of delta V the change the, the difference between the two vectors you take the length of that and that'll that'll be uh, that distance okay and um, so really quick now again you don't you're not responsible for this but um, delta V divided by the length of V1 okay is approximately equal to R theta over R if you know your arc length formula and this is true for um, small theta so this is for theta much less than one okay and so this this the R's cancel and you just have theta so that means that delta let me copy it again delta V over V um, or actually you know what let me now do this let me take this equation on it equal to theta approximately equal to theta and let me uh, multiply both sides by V1 over delta T okay so I the V1 on the left side and the denominator canceled and so uh, this is equal to um, I can replace theta with uh, the arc length divided by the radius it's equal to the theta in radians okay and so um, this arc length divided by radians that's also equal to V1 excuse me not V1 um, this whole expression that I have left over right here if you think about it work it out again if you're if something some steps here aren't clear I can help you with this but if you simplify what I have there you'll see that you get V squared over R okay that's a very quick rundown of how you would work out that centripetal acceleration formula okay um, and as the and the limit as the angle delta theta gets smaller and smaller the approximation becomes exact okay all right so let's now do some example problems with uh, this formula okay and by the way I gave you the acceleration formula we know that from Newton's second law that um, the acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass okay or you could say the net force equals ma so therefore for centripetal for, let me put a little c for centripetal for centripetal force uh, multiplying the the acceleration by m we get mv squared over r okay and let's do an example okay um, so let's see how about um, a car drives in let's, yeah, a car drives in a circle with a radius of 20 meters at 10 meters per second what is the ex acceleration what is the force what is a centripetal force and then lastly what is causing the centripetal force okay so drawing a picture top view car going in a circle okay and it has a speed of 10 meters per second and we want to know what is the acceleration the acceleration v squared over r 10 squared over 20 is 5 meters per second squared okay what and uh, for the uh, I, I didn't give you the mass let's say uh, assume mass of uh, 
1,000 kilograms, okay? So for the centripetal force, we now do uh, mv squared over r, or m times the centripetal acceleration, so that's going to be 5,000 newtons, okay? Now, so what is causing the centripetal force. What causes the car to be able to do this circular motion? Any guesses? Okay. Um, what do you have to do when you drive in a circle? Don't you have to turn the steering wheel? Right? Now, what exactly happens when you turn the steering wheel? What you're doing is your, your tires are turning into the direction of the you want to go. So if I can draw it on my car picture, they're kind of turning this way, right? Now, your tires are meeting the ground, they're pressing into the ground, um, what is that going to cause? Isn't that going to cause a frictional force against the tires? Okay. Now, because the tires are turned, it'll turn out that that force is, uh, it'll turn out that it'll be centripetal. Okay, you turn them just right and you'll get the, f and then as you keep going in the circle, that frictional force will keep adjusting as the position of the tires keep adjusting. And the long and short of it is that the friction is what's causing the centripetal force, the centripetal acceleration. Isn't that cool? Okay, um, the moon going around the earth, it's gravity that's the centripetal force, the centripetal agent. Okay, if you tie a rock to a string and twirl it in a horizontal circle, the tension of the string is what's is the centripetal force. All right? So those are those are a couple of examples for you.